So the first thing that we're going to cover in this video is an explanation of what exactly the idea is here. That is essentially some sort of crisis or culmination of various crises or disasters that are essentially fabricated or orchestrated. Now this will be done for a variety of purposes and we'll get more into the why this will happen uh, after this section. But the purposes behind this will be one to distract. But since most people nowadays don't are starting to lose faith and belief in the current so-called news outlets and different events, the these events that will be planned essentially are, are planned already will need to be real real and localized across many different areas. Now the next thing, the next sort of benefit for these people who are on these organizations who are orchestrated in such events is to inculcate themselves to establish themselves as the response to it, just like with their so-called response to COVID was really just the cover for operations of power grab or to solidify control essentially and this would be the same case here of course it will be more real than that apparent disaster and it will involve mass casualty the mass casualty is important because it's the one thing that grabs attention now it will also serve to uh, ignite or attempt to ignite anyway their civil war and the war itself will have a lot to do with them maintaining their control and so it, it will essentially speak and all come down to an attempt to maintain control through crisis just like that movie our brand is crisis that's what this is all about and there's that often quoted phrase Never let a good crisis go to waste. So the why, to start with, we can find under the Can Code of Canon Law, Book 5, Temporal Goods of the Church, Liber, which means Book 5, De Bonus Ecclesiae, Temporal Laudibus. To pursue its proper purposes, the Catholic Church, by innate right, is able to acquire, retain, administer, and alienate temporal goods independently from civil power independently from civil power is very important. To the proper purposes are principally to order divine worship, to care for the decent support of the clergy and other ministers, and to exercise works of the sacred apostolate and charity, especially toward the needy. The universal church, that term there, right? The universal, universal being the operative word here, church and the apostolic see, the particular churches as well as any other juridical person, Public or private are subjects capable of acquiring, retaining, administering, and alienating temporal goods according to the norm of law. Under the supreme authority of the Roman pontiff, ownership of goods belonging to that juridic person which has acquired them legitimately. All temporal goods which belong to the universal, universal, repeat that again, church, the ap apostolic see, or other juridic persons in the church are ecclesiastical goods and are governed by the fallen canons and their own statutes. The temporal goods of a private juridic person are governed by its own statutes, but not by these canons unless other provision is expressly made. In the following canons, the term church signifies not only the universal church or the apostolacy, but also any public juridic person in the church unless it is otherwise apparent from the context or the nature of the matter. So there, the operative word is universal church. So, from that canon code, we can get an understanding that this revolves around the control structure of the universities. The universities, essentially speaking, are the operational mechanism of control which relates to the ability to alienate temporal goods. To start with, the PAGE program, which is not as well known as it probably should be, 
across the entire country and the United States, but likely in other countries as well, provides the bulk of operational components for legislative and government offices and is essentially the talent pool taken from the universities. So there is a direct link for the universities being able to control the so-called phony governments. Next, we find out that universities carry essentially control, at least, the bulk of processing as relates to the internet. The Harvard MIT Data Center is a member of the Institute for Quantitative Social Science. It was established in the early 1960s as the original data center for political and social science at Harvard University. And here's an article, Why Universities Require a Data Center Provider. If the university technology team is looking to pursue higher performance computing initiatives, but is struggling to figure out support and financing, consulting with a specialized data center provider is the best first step in its journey. Now at uh, Austin, Texas. Austin shared data center in the fall of 2016. The University of, of Texas at Austin Data Center's team joined the University of Texas System Shared Data Centers for program opening our space services, blah, blah, blah. So, all these universities, they have data sh centers which all relate to cloud computing or sharing the load, as it were, for processing and thus, essentially, giving over control of the internet to the university system, the component of the universal church. And we find uh, about, at about Google how they started and the Google story begins in 1995 at Stanford University. Larry Page was considering Stanford for grad school and Sergey Brin, a student there was assigned to show him around. By some accounts, they disagreed about nearly everything during that first meeting, blah, blah, blah. Now, according to the book Life After Google, the uh, patent or the control of Google was owned by Stanford and is essentially a vehicle of the university, a universal system component, main component anyway, of the universal church. As it relates to this idea of control over technology and the internet, we'll look to a, a filing, October 2021 Faculty Senate Packet, University of Nebraska at Kearney Faculty Senate. This is from the 10-7-2021 and notice the banner open spaces at UNK, Scholarship Preservation and Creative Endeavors. Here at the bottom of this section on page 13, which I've highlighted, it states, number nine, alter course title, prerequisite course description, cyber, 435, reverse engineering, thinking like an adversary, CYSY CBT cyber systems department, overall curriculum changes. Change course title, old value, thinking like an adversary, systems, side, security, new value, reverse engineering, thinking like an adversary, change prerequisites, blah, blah, blah. This course will cover all concepts necessary to play offense against different types of enterprise networks and systems, red team, different scenarios will be played out utilizing a series of hands-on labs with the idea that students will learn the concept of thinking like an adversary. So there, of course, they're making a body of hackers, but essentially a... a control structure over the internet and Google, right? They control Google. So that all comes down to the control of uh, a large number of systems, but also the ability to control information, which is very important. So here we've established the university's control of the internet and information. Now, the University of Liberty which is not a land grant school, mind you, but essentially speaking, operates like one. Well, they dominate the city of Lynchburg in Virginia. Now, what this university can do is that they can control the housing market. And they do this the way most other universities do it, which is by renting out to students at fixed prices. And in that way, they can essentially, speaking, fix the property or market value in the region. They can drive out any competition, any private individuals attempting to rent out to students because they control the area. 
they can also dump on the market or they can arbitrarily increase property value. Thus, that's a demonstration of the university ability to control the land itself. This brings us to the Wikipedia article on Common Core. The Common Core State Standards Initiative, also known as simply Common Core, was a multi-state educational initiative begun in 2010 with the goal of increasing consistency across state standards or what K-12 students throughout the United States should know in English, language, arts, and mathematics at the conclusion of each school grade. The initiative was sponsored by National Governors Association and the Council of Chief State School Officers. Yeah, that sounds super official and very formidable, right? The initiative also sought to provide states and schools with articulated expectations around the skills students graduating from high school needed in order to be prepared to enter credit-bearing courses at two- or four-year college programs or to enter the workforce. So essentially speaking, this all comes down to the control over the population through the children to turn them into viable minions or rather slaves. In the 1990s, a movement began in the U.S. to establish national educational standards for students across the country. Yeah, I wonder who started that. Outlining what students were expected to know and do at each grade level, implementing ways to find out if they were meeting those standards. In late 2008, the NGA convened a group to work on developing standards. This team included Dave Coleman, William McCallum of the University of Arizona, Phil Darrow, Douglas Clements, and Student Achievement Partners founders Jason Zimba and Susan and hell to write standards in the areas of English, language, arts, and mathematics. Announced on June 1st, 2019, the initiative's stated purpose was to provide a consistent, clear understanding of what students are expected to learn so teachers and parents know what they need to do to help them. Additionally, the standards are designed to be robust and relevant to the real world, reflecting the knowledge and skills that our young people, right, our young people, right, they don't belong to the parents, they belong to these people need for success in college and careers which should place American students in a position in which they can compete on a global, in a global economy. Work groups composed of representatives from higher education, K-12 education teachers and researchers drafted the Common Core State Standards. The work groups consulted educators, administrators, community and parent organizations, higher education representatives, business community, researchers, civil rights groups and states with feedback on each of the drafts. So the main thing to notice here is that they have listed this as Common Core as in the core of the structure, the core of the universal church. The ability to alienate temporal goods, and that includes people. Now, we'll look at an example of the university's methods to institute control and the violence that is perpetrated and how this essentially has been done already. This idea of instituting disasters, starting essentially a civil war, and the use of mass casualty events to essentially establish or retain control. So this is from the Central Intelligence Agency National Foreign Assessment Center, 15 February 1980, Brightest Terrorism in El Salvador Memorandum. Fearing that the governing junta will be unable to prevent a takeover by the revolutionary left, rightists in El Salvador are stepping up violent actions. Their goal is to retaliate against the left and to encourage a right-wing coup. Although our information on vigilante groups is stretchy, partly reflecting their history of fading in and out of existence, the involvement of security force personnel and members of the economic elite is widely accepted and substantiated by our own reporting. A principal rightist paramilitary organization, the White Warriors Union, UDB, was formed in 1977. It focused its initial activities on the clergy, claiming responsibility for murdering a Jesuit priest in mid-1977 and threatening to kill all remaining Jesuits if they did not leave El Salvador by year's end. Last year, the organization killed another priest, and it probably was involved in dozens of additional but unattributed murders of teachers, peasants, and leftist activists. The UDB published a communist last or communique last month threatening further action against the left. Now, I would have to imagine a lot of this is sounding pretty familiar. Here, the next portion of the document. In the past, suspicion of government involvement with the terrorist right was 
prompted by ex-president Romero's reluctance to speak out or crack down against the UGB. A new group, the Organization for Liberation from Communism, OLC, which announced its formation last month and took credit for two bombings, may be linked to the former head of the Guard, who is known for his ultra-conservative views. The OLC may have been responsible for killing a leader of a prominent leftist party that withdrew from the government in January. An active duty National Guard officer reportedly led the team responsible for one of the recent bombings. Hardliners in the economic elite probably have provided personal funds, equipment, and organizing ability to the rightist cause. Now, we look at a different document, which is related to the same thing. This is out of Cuba. Subject, Ecumenical Council Condemns Killing of Jesuits. Tax the Ecumenical Council of Cuba joins in with all international institutions and figures who have voiced their condemnation repudiating the killing of Ignacio Ella Coria, or Ella Coria, rector of the Central American University based in El Salvador. There's your university component. Vice Rector Amando Lopez, four Jesuit priests, two domestic employees, in a statement released in Havana today. The Ecumenical Council of Cuba asserted it is not difficult to see that the material authors of this terrible crime were instigated by the same ones who killed Archbishop Monsignor Arnulfo Romero. In the meantime, OAS Secretary General Joao, I believe that's probably Joao, Benia Suarez, which is interesting because that's Portuguese, will arrive in El Salvador tomorrow to attempt to establish a dialogue between the forces in conflict in a Central American nation. Bena Suarez stated to the press in Washington that his peace mission was a mandate of the OAS General Assembly in light of the worsening of the war between the Salvadoran ultra rightist government and the Farabundo Marti National Liberation Front. And this is from. Well, I actually don't see a date there. But either way, it would have come after. Now we come to the mass casualty incident, which served many purposes for what it was intended. At approximately 11.30 hours local on the day, Major Beltran arrived in the scene. Beltran is the, it's hard to read, 5th Brigade, something of the 5th Brigade. Beltran was accompanied by two interrogators, uh, right by helicopter. As a result of the inter interrogations of the prisoners, six more persons were detained, making a total of 10. Between 1,300 and 1,400 hours local, Major Beltran took the decision to kill 10 persons and was, uh, was opposed in this decision by the two lieutenants who maintained this was an illegal order which would compromise military personnel. From that, uh, no, I'm not sure what that says, Major Beltran assumed command of the unit and began giving direct orders to subordinates. He ordered Sergeant George Al or Jorge Alberto Tobar Guzman to go along the road to La Cebadilla and set up an ambush using captured equipment. Sergeant Guzman, accompanied by some soldiers, established the ambush at approximately 1530 or 1530 hours local. Civilians were led by various members of the troop to the selected location. A mine was exploded and a hand grenade was thrown, resulting in an undetermined number of dead, but the majority of the civilians wounded who were then killed by members of the unit on the orders of Major Beltran. A poster and subversive propaganda were left in the place where the dead were to justify or simulate an insurgent ambush. The leg of one soldier was smeared with blood, and he was evacuated to the brigade on the orders of Major Beltran. In that same helicopter was transported the captured equipment, with exception of the explosives, which were later destroyed. During the following days, Major Beltran spread the false version of events and ordered all subordinate personnel to stick to that story. In order to lend credence to his false version of events, Major Beltran selected a soldier wounded in another operation to present as the soldier allegedly wounded in the supposed ambush. This version of events is based on the spontaneous declarations made to the SHC by the military personnel who were present at the scene. Conclusions, the events which took place on 21st September 1988 in the town of San Francisco, San Sebastian, San Vicente Department, were not the result of an insurgent ambush, but involved the responsibility of military personnel of the 5th Infantry Brigade. So there we they have a mass casualty unit, or a mass casualty event, which they ascribe to the military. We will find out what the implications of that are later on in this video. But either way, here is an example of what happens when the authority and the control of the universal church and the university system is threatened. Now today on campuses, many of us are aware of the nonsensical protests that have been drummed up there about Palestine and Israel. Of course, we've had quite a lot of this considering the events of 2020 and essentially speaking this entire decade. 
and the previous decade. However, something interesting about it is that they have been using the, or I guess you could say the uh, normalizing of the use of so-called law enforcement to retain control of the universities by sending in uh, troopers and state troopers in very obvious staged events to carry off protesters that is establishing their control over the law enforcement and their ability to use them to protect their universal assets, as it were. Now, as far as we lead into the real estate and other implications of this control structure, we'll start by looking at a interesting post uh, Pickerington, Ohio, Fairfield County, Buy, Sell, Trade, Sherry Looney and the Loon Crew, Howard Hanna Real Estate Services. This listing a price drop from 400 or to $464,999, and who knows what the original price was there, because they don't say. And this is listed for a property in Lancaster, Ohio, which is four bedrooms and two full bathrooms. So that's almost half a million dollars for a four bedroom house. That is very much uh, overpriced. And so this is listing Shara Looney and Howard Hanna. The business filings on this, or starting from this particular post on Facebook, are going to get very interesting. So Sherry L. Looney is listed on the filing for Saba Properties LLC, but there's no mention of Howard Hanna on this filing. And under the first Howard Hanna filing we're going to look at, it states John Wood as the registrant and states assisting leases, leases of residential properties owned or managed by Smythe Kramer doing business as Howard Hanna out of Cleveland. And then when we come to a different document, we have Howard Hanna Mortgage Services. Uh, and it uh, has been given consent to Howard Hanna Financial Services Incorporated to use that name by Donald A. Latore, president. Then we have this filing out of Pennsylvania, but filed in Ohio, County of Allegheny. Mark D. Steele. This is for Howard Hanna Financial Services Incorporated. And in the Dark Knight Rises movie, the Pittsburgh Steelers in Pennsylvania, their stadium was blown up through subterranean bombs, essentially, breaking open the field and causing, essentially, a very public, very, uh, uh, essentially, a widely seen mass casualty event. Now we come to the business fighting Barrister's Land Abstract Company. This is listed in Pennsylvania, Pittsburgh. 119 Gammon Drive, Title Insurance Agency, Howard W. Hanna, and this is filed in Florida. On the list of names for this filing, we have Howard W. Hanna III at the same address as everyone else, which will be 119 Gammon Drive, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Then we have Annie Hanna Sestra, David F. Lloyd, Mark D. Steele, isn't that a nice name, David F. Lloyd, Annie Hanna Sester, and F. Duffy Hanna. Then we go to Virginia with the filing under the Heritage Title LTD, LTD meaning limited, generally known as a European designator for LLC. Now on the list of names we have F. Duffy Hanna, Annie Hanna Sester, there's a new one, Tracy Rossetti Delvu and Howard W. Hanna III. However, these list all the same address as 291 Independence Boulevard, ST300, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Strangely enough, this uh, listing of the Heritage Title LTD has the registered agent name as J. Jeffrey Tinkham and it's using the 291 Independence Boulevard, ST300, Virginia Beach. However, there are other 
listings under the name J. Jeffrey Tinkham, such as 119 Gamma Drive, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, under the Heritage Title Associates Incorporated uh, business listing. Also, you have the Barristers of Virginia listing under J. Jeffrey Tinkham. Now, if we go to the UK, we find something called TU Finance Number One Limited, a business filing under a Peter B. Tinkham. And then this individual is listed out of Dallas, Texas. However, it's important to notice at the bottom, there is a particular signature that is of note. I'm not sure what it says. It looks like it's written love or something else. Either way, that signature, the second signature on this line, the second part of the second signature, that's the one to notice. That same signature, that second part, almost exact, is listed under a filing Lucian James Limited for the TU Finance Limited, that same company ascribed to Peter Tinkham. Also, when we look at the other signatures on this document, we find out that the Lucian Marine James signature is very much different than the other one which one has to wonder where exactly that signature comes from, which will we will see the same signature repeated across other business filings attributed to Lucian James Limited. Now, under the Endel website, Miss Lucian Maureen James is listed as having 344 total companies as director, and then 309 resigned, 27 dissolved, and 8 other. On company check, it states Miss Lucian James holds zero appointments at zero active companies, has resigned from 178 companies, and held 22 appointments at 22 dissolved companies. Their longest current appointment spans zero years, one month, and 22 days at Global Force Holding PLC. Not suspicious at all. And on company check, Miss Lucian James has resigned directorships of 178, closed directorships of 2022, or 22, and total directorships of 344, which matches up to the number on that previous page. And for the general information from company searches made simple.com, we have Lucian James Limited, which apparently is the director of 4,728 companies and 33 is secretary, and first appointed on 19, uh, 8 19, 1991, 32 years and 11 months. So, as far as this rabbit trail goes, we have the BlackRock World Mining Trust Limited, changed to the name Merrill Lynch World Mining Trust Limited. Under the BlackRock World Mining Trust PLC, we have listed Lucy and James Limited, the declarance signature and the signature of the commissioner oath. Both of those don't match the signature of Lucy and James Limited. So in the United States, we have Cross Country Pipeline Supply Company Incorporated is an Arkansas domestic for-profit corporation. Filed on January 24th, 1992, the company's finance status list is merged. The registered agent on file for this company, the corporation service company is located at blah, blah, blah. The company has three contacts on record. The contacts are John James, Maureen James, and R. Aaron Brooks. Maureen James is the name to look at there. And this is according to Visipedia. Now, under the name Peter Tinkham, we have various listings. But the one to look at is NSAT Pipeline Company. And the likelihood of these patterns all matching up perfectly is... It was evidence, essentially, that these are not only fake business filings, but this is a revolving door of control, which relates back to that idea of alienating temporal goods under the universal church. Going to Texas, we find out the NSAT Pipeline Company is listed with the registered agent of Texas Utilities Services Incorporated. So it's a utility company controlled by a line of phony business filings which leads at least through the UK but 
I'm sure leads many other places as well. So as far as these mass casualty events, we have the example for the United States of killing Texas Nidal Hassan, a U.S. Army major and psychiatrist, fatally shot 13 people and injured more than 30 others. It was the deadliest mass shooting on an American military base and the deadliest terrorist attack in the United States since September 11th attacks until it was surpassed by the San Bernardino attack in 2015. Sama shot as a result paralyzed from the waist down. He was arraigned at a military court on July 20th, 2011. He was charged with 13 counts of premeditated murder and 32 counts of attempted murder under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. His court martial began on August 7th, 2013. Due to the nature of the charges, more than one premeditated or first degree murder case in a single crime, Hassan faced either the death penalty or life in prison without parole upon conviction. Hassan was found guilty on 13 counts of premeditated murder and 32 counts of attempted premeditated murder. On August 23rd, 2013, was sentenced to death on August 28th, 2013. So that ends the situation there, right? Except, of course, for the fact that a lot of these events seem to be happening and continuing to happen. And all of it revolves around maintenance of control and the use of these events. Now, there's a lot of speculation on whether or not this event was indeed real, which goes around currently and would lead naturally to the need for true mass casualty events because people just don't trust the liars anymore. So as it relates to Fort Hood, we have a large number of news articles talking about the various uh, bodies that have been discovered around Fort Hood, and this was going on in 2020. Uh, we have a headline stating about 12 soldiers, soldiers missing, Fort Hood soldiers body found near base, their death in a month. Then there's, of course, the Vanessa Guillen, uh, the one that was promoted above basically all other bodies found near the base. Then we also have a headline about eight soldiers who died at Fort Hood and then 16 soldier deaths at Fort Hood in the year 2020. So clearly things going on there, or so it would seem. The mass casualty events at certain areas seem to be a theme. Of course, in the movie Star Wars, there was the part in, I believe it was episode three, in which the emperor, or well at that point would be the chancellor, orders the execution of Order 66, which leads to the turning of the clone troopers on those that they had been serving next to the whole time throughout the Clone Wars, and essentially gunning down anyone who, uh, in the back, basically shooting anyone in the back who were their allies that uh, weren't part of them, like the Wookiees or the Jedi. Of course, Order 66 also relates to the killing of children at the hands of the uh, of Anakin Skywalker, who became Darth Vader. And it's unlikely, of course, that I'm doing any spoilers here because the movie has been out a long time. But there is a theme there, a sort of teaching moment for what is likely to happen in the future. And as we know, mass casualty events are often far more impactful when children are involved. This brings us to the narrative of The Killing Fields, which is a 1984 British biographical drama film about the Khmer Rouge regime in Cambodia, which is based on the experiences of two journalists, Cambodian Dith Pran and American Sidney Schoenberg. It was directed by Roland Joff and produced by David Putnam for his company Goldcrest Films. And the rest of this is not really important. Then the Wikipedia article about the killing fields are sites in Cambodia where collectively more than 1,300,000 people were killed and buried by the Communist Party of Kampukea during Khmer Rouge rule from 1975 to 79, immediately after the end of the Cambodian Civil War, 1970 to 75. There's a theme there, which we are seeing, which we saw in El Salvador, with those um, previous CIA documents, and here we've got Cambodia, and currently we have the same thing playing out in the United States. 
The mass killings are part of the broad state-sponsored Cambodian genocide. The Cambodian journalist Death Pran coined the term killing fields after his escape from the regime. The Khmer Rouge arrested and eventually executed almost everyone suspected of connections with former government and foreign government. Notice that. Former government or foreign government, as well as professionals and intellectuals. The professional and intellectual is a component that would relate to universities. Ethnic Vietnamese, ethnic Thai, ethnic Chinese, ethnic Cham, Cambodian Christians, and Buddhist monks were the demographic targets of persecution. As a result, Pol Pot has been described as a genocidal tyrant. Martin Shaw described the Cambodian genocide as the purest genocide of the Cold War era. In 1979, Vietnam invaded democratic Kampukea and toppled the Khmer Rouge regime, ending the genocide. Now, when it comes to these mass killing events, usually conveniently blamed on the military, their opposition, as it were, the enemies of the universities, considering there is about only one operational power structure that can contend against them, which would be the conventional military structure. Well, there are a number of sniper or shooter positions that are perfect toward the stadiums, football fields, or fairgrounds, as well as the area being uh, open, generally having open spaces, which uh, active shooters and uh, pretty much anyone with a, a moderate competence in shooting really could pick off targets without an issue. Also, when we look at the structure and um, the design of certain fairgrounds, and I'm sure this will be the same across uh, the entire country, we not only see many open spaces, but we see vantage points around the area in which multiple shooters can target those who are caught in the open and they won't have anywhere to go because they'll caught, essentially speaking, uh, essentially speaking, they will be caught in a crossfire. Also, we'll notice with many of these stages of these uh, designs around fairgrounds, We'll notice there are nearby stadiums in large cities. As well, a lot of the area have, a lot, a lot of, many portions of the area have distance markers. What someone might think of a, in a parking lot as the lines for parking vehicles can easily turn into distance markers for shooting uh, victims in a mass casualty event. So this brings us to the mass casualty event of Lahaina, which is more recent than the other examples that we saw. This article is dated August 28, 2023. A cascade of breakdowns in Lahaina fire exposes flaws in emergency management system. Sounds like the flaws in the active shooter system that recently took place that is currently in the news. So-called news, anyway. Here this article states, with Lahaina in ruins, more than 100 people confirmed dead and hundreds more missing, there is a growing body of evidence showing state and county emergency management officials knew a hurricane-fed fire was likely and drought impacted West Maui on August 8th and failed adequately prepare for it. Ultimately, the Hawaii agencies responsible for preparing for disasters and managing the response failed to alert people to the threat until it was too late and bungled efforts to shepherd them to safety. Of course, most, I would say anyway, believe that this was not a bungled effort and it was in fact designed, orchestrated, and it was done intentionally, or at least reported, because who knows if any of these events are even real and ever even happened. The reasons why will be explored in a state authorized inv investigation. Yeah, they're going to investigate themselves, sure. But it's already known that the main agency in charge, the Maui Emergency Management Agency, was led by an inexperienced administrator, Erman Andaya who left the island despite National Weather Service warnings of a serious fire threat. The county itself was guided by a new mayor, Richard Beeson, who appeared out of the loop as the fire burned. MEMA was being supported by a state emergency management agency that itself weakened by high turnover in recent years. Multiple former employees told Civil Beat and communication between the state and county proved faulty. Major General Kenneth Hara, the head of the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency, told Hawaii News Now this week that he didn't know anyone who had died until the following day. So naturally, they blame this on incompetence, and that's becoming a theme. Multiple events being blamed on incompetence. Of course, imagine one of compounding disasters all created across a countrywide scale, 
in many different areas all at the same time, and they can blame all the mass casualty events on incompetence because they control the response and they also control the event. In continuation, I feel like a lot of these fatalities could have been avoided with a warning, said Ingrid Lynch, a Front Street resident who called her daughter to say her goodbyes before narrowly escaping the flames. Marty Baum, a foreigner, former Lahaina resident who now lives in Haiku, said the government has neglected the coastal town for years and let us down at a crucial moment. Yeah, right. I'm heartbroken over Lahaina. I knew so many people there, and a lot of them have been not been heard from. He said, there's no accountability. They won't say, I'm sorry. And well... That's, of course, coming from the perspective that this was a bungled effort and was not, in fact, intentionally orchestrated. There are still many unanswered questions about the state and county's emergency preparedness and response. Many could be answered in the weeks and months ahead. Civil Beat has filed public records requests for planning documents and requests for assistance between local, state, and federal agencies, but the county and state have yet to release any of that information. So now we're going to look into the specifics of how they are going to carry out this mass casualty event. And we'll start with a document limiting and planning for schools as temporary evacuation centers in emergencies, policy brief and practice guidance for Pacific nations and support worldwide initiative for safe schools. Notice that is a worldwide initiative. So this is we're going to find out in other books relating to the United States that this is in fact not just relegated to the Pacific nations, but is in fact, as it says, a worldwide initiative. First, we have educational continuity. So that tells you what their primary purpose is here, to continue the control of over the common core. Beyond the basic human rights to shelter and survival, access to education is the developmental right of children, access to both quality education and educational continuity is fundamental to reducing the impact of harmful socioeconomic and health conditions caused by poverty, which is made even worse by disasters or conflict. They basically just described what I said in coded language there. Ongoing access to quality education in a disaster crisis environment is crucial because contact between teachers and students is essential to student retention and for them to achieve their learning outcomes. And that is right out of the Cardinal Principles, a very creepy document from 1918. The right to educational continuity means thriving striving to maintain a certain number of student slash teacher contact hours per school year. Schools provide a safe that provide a child-friendly space and physical protection from dangers. Learners in safe learning environment are less likely to be physically, economically, or sexually exploited. That's uh, partially true, but also not true. It's a uh, double speak for you. Learners in a safe environment are not exposed to other risks, such as forced or early marriage, recruitment into armed forces, or groups or organized crime. I like how they put recruitment into armed forces. Uh, along the lines of forced marriage and organized crime. Educational opportunities reduce the psycho psychosocial impact of emergencies and disasters. They provide role continuity, sense of normalcy, structure, stability, calm in a crisis, and hope for the future. Assuring quality education for future generations is vital for aiding recovery, achieving sustainable and peaceful development and security. Ding, ding, ding. There's your word, sustainability. Access to quality education contributes directly to the social, economic, and political stability of societies. That's, of course, their universal church. Common core university control structure. It helps reduce the risk of violent conflict by enhancing social cohesion and supporting conflict resolution and peace building. It enables parents to engage in recovery activities and return to work. Enables parents to engage. That's nice wording there. School is a place where children and youth who need other assistance, such as health care, nutrition, or child protection, can be identified, supported, and monitored. Schools provide life-saving knowledge, skills, and services for safety and survival, such as standard operating procedures for disasters and emergencies, sanitation and health guidance, disease prevention, mine awareness, conflict resolution, and peace building. I find it interesting that is listed there. Mine awareness. What exactly that means? Now we have school as temporary evacuation centers. Why are they used? When homes are destroyed or damaged during a disaster caused by natural hazards such as storms, floods, earthquake, landslides, tsunamis, and volcanic eruptions. Doesn't look like they have fire there, but there you go. 
It is common for public spaces and buildings to be used for shelter until people can safely return home. Shelter is a critical requirement for survival and is necessary to protect security and health. Shelter is also important for human dignity, to sustain family and community life, and to enable affected populations to recover from the impact of disaster. Yeah, it so happens that they make a lot of these disasters. Schools are often deliberately chosen by disaster management authorities to serve as shelters. Schools can offer protection from the elements, have water and sanitation facilities, offer classrooms and assembly areas, and are recognized as child-friendly spaces. Schools are also important institutions and community hubs. They have a high degree of visibility and familiarity for local communities, particularly elementary schools that are center of range of community activities. As a result, communities may simply go to the school for shelter without direction from disaster management authorities. Because of conscious efforts to protect children, in many communities, schools are designed and constructed to be the most disaster resilient structures available. Of course, it also, you know, has a lot to do with their ability to control the response to events that they make. So there's that. Not going to list that here, of course. That would be too on the nose. In some instances, for example, in parts of Bangladesh, India, Philippines, Japan, and the U.S., schools have been specifically designed with additional shelter facilities, for example, for cyclones or tornadoes, to serve as community evacuation centers. Which most of those evacuations are going to be, quote-unquote, mandatory, through essentially threat of arms, as were. How are they used? The most common ways that schools are used as shelters are shelter in place for the school population to keep students, education personnel, and visitors safe from harm during sudden severe weather such as tornadoes and flash floods, American Red Cross 2012, and Sorensen and Vogt 2006, and after sudden onset emergencies until students can be safely reunited with their families. Short-term evacuation centers for safe havens for students, families, and community members sheltering in response to threats or hazards, especially from storms, floods, severe weather, and tsunami early warnings. Collective centers for the communal shelter of internally displaced persons or refugees whose homes have been destroyed or are unsafe due to a disaster or conflict. And occupation by armed forces. Now, what's interesting is that in the same document it states, have you planned to make sure schools are never used for military purposes or occupied it by or occupied by fighting forces. If there are any groups in your region or community that have grievances or are prone to conflict, it is wise to learn about appro approaches to ensure that schools are respected as zones of peace. Hmm, sounds kind of like a safe space by all parties. This planning helps to ensure that they are never attacked and never used by any type of armed groups. In this instance, you may also need to consider physical protection of infrastructure such as fencing perimeters and guards. Hmm. Now what exactly does that sound like? Perhaps something called a FEMA camp, maybe? This definitely has to do with uh, protecting children or protecting their children as they see it from the consequences of their disaster, um, their disaster events, mass casualty events. And then, of course, naturally, in this document, which is all about disaster response, they can't help but show what they're really concerned with. See, they have standards of behavior where they limit your noise during school hours uh, and they don't allow inappropriate language and they don't want any damage to quote unquote school property which I'm sure they see children as their property their children right we need to protect our children as they would say and have said in these documents so that's interesting that uh, in this document about disaster response they still care about protection of their property. So this brings us to another document, Guide for Developing High Quality School Emergency Operations Plan. And this is listed with FEMA, but a few other alleged government agencies as well. So we have the Acu evacuation annex. I won't read through all of this, it's a lot to go through. This annex focuses on the course of action schools will execute to evacuate school buildings and grounds. The planning team should consider to follow when developing their goals, objectives, and courses in action, how to safely move students and visitors to designated assembly areas from classrooms, outside areas, cafeterias, and other school locations. 
like say a football field or the fairground. And then we have the lockdown annex. The annex focus on the course of action schools will execute to secure school buildings and grounds during incidents that pose an immediate threat of violence in and around the school. The primary objective of lockdown is to quickly ensure all school staff, students, and visitors are secured in the rooms away from immediate danger. Yeah, of course, if they create that danger, then that's something. Then we have the shelter in place annex, which focuses on courses of action when students and staff are required to remain indoors, perhaps for an extended period of time, because it's safer inside the building or room than outside. Depending on threat or hazard, students and staff may be required to move to rooms that can be sealed, such as the event of chemical or biological hazard or without windows or to a weather shelter, such as the event of tornado. And of course, they can only ever have the best of intentions for doing such a thing mandatorily. Then we have the Accounting Part for All Persons Annex, the Communications and Warning Annex. Then we have the specifically listed Family Reunification Annex. Then we have the Continuity of Operation. Now what exactly did they call that thing in the other document? Continuity of Education, I think it was. Then we have the Recovery Annex here which lists academic recovery above physical recovery. Then we have the Public Health, Medical and Mental Health Annex, which is interesting. Then we have the Security Annex, which is an interesting one, and is a representation of how they intend to use their so-called law enforcement as a way to guard their disaster response facilities from, say, military occupation. Then we have threat and hazard types and examples, natural hazard, technological hazards, which is interesting, biological hazards, adversarial, incidental, and human-caused threats. So imagine, of course, if you had multiples that happened all along these lists and it was all orchestrated and there were a lot of casualties and they could say, oh, well, they weren't prepared to deal with so many different events. Forget about just the fire in Lahaina. This would be, say, fires, power outages, water outages, leaks, uh, you know, things caused by degradation of infrastructure, as we're seeing today. And then naturally there will be some bombs and violence, which they will attribute to the ongoing conflict between the left and the right. Now we have the law enforcement unit record exemption to the definition of education records. FERPA defines a law enforcement unit as any individual officer, department, division, or other component of an educational agency or institution, such as a unit of commissioned police officers or non-commissioned security guards, that is officially authorized or de designated by that agency or institution to, one, enforce any local, state, or federal law, or refer to appropriate authorities a matter for enforcement of any local, state, or federal law against any individual organization other than the agency or institution itself, or maintain the physical security and safety of the agency or institution. And we find out that there's a lot of things included here where law enforcement unit records, which are not subject to the FERPA consent requirements, are defined as records that are created by a law enforcement unit, created for a law enforcement purpose, and maintained by the law enforcement unit. Of course, a lot of this stuff definitely goes out the window, and they don't exactly follow any of their phony laws anyway. Then, of course, we have, as we've seen in the uh, in these other documents, the pattern of shelter-in-place here we have this document from July 2019, Department of Homeland Security, Planning Considerations, Evacuation, and Shelter-in-Place, Guidance for State, Local, Tribal, and Territorial Partners. Here we have the planning principles listed, Shelter-in-Place first slash default option. Jurisdictions should always consider shelter-in-place as a first slash default option. When feasible, this may mean looking at risk more closely and, when possible, advising populations to shelter in place. Shelter in place involves the use of a structure, including homes, to temporarily separate individuals from a hazard or threat. 
Shelter in place is appropriate when conditions require that individuals seek protection in their homes, places of employment, or other locations when a hazard or threat is imminent or occurring. Individuals with access and functional needs should be a priority for restoration of services and safety checks as they may be at greater risk throughout a prolonged shelter in place order. When population shelter in place, jurisdictions reduce costs, resource requirement, and negative impacts of evacuations while promoting improved response and quicker reentry for those who spontaneously evacuate and recovery. Of course, considering the way that they do this across the board, the shelter in place is the first default option. That would increase the number of casualties in the mass casualty event. This relates to something called the Protocol Document 47B. This is um, <clears throat> about uh, a program, essentially, that is, in this context, well identified. So we have a warning. This document contains highly sensitive information. Unauthor unauthorized access or distribution is punishable by law. Scary. Phase one, information gathering. Conduct covert surveillance of target areas. Identify key community leaders and potential resistors. Map out all available housing resources. Assess current occupancy rates and demographics. Phase two, resource depletion. Gradually reduce the maintenance and upkeep of targeted housing, implement subtle infrastructure degradation, introduce controlled scarcity of essential services. That will naturally lead to a disaster where, of course, a mass casualty events, well, many mass casualty events are likely. Then we have phase three and phase four, which are almost picture perfect carbon copies of what is described in those uh, disaster uh, manuals, operating manuals. Phase 3 Relocation Initiative Launch public health and safety campaigns to justify relocations. Offer incentives for voluntary relocation. Implement mandatory evacuation orders where necessary. Coordinate with re-education centers for resistant individuals. Phase 4 Area Securitization Establish perimeter control around neutralized zones, like a school. Deploy automated surveillance systems. Initiate disinformation campaigns to de deter resettlement. Prepare sites for future repurposing. Now we come to the Evacuation Planning Guide for Stadiums from the Department of Homeland Security Fall 2008. And of course, we're going to find that it's got very similar guidelines as far as all the other ones were. Here we have, as expected, shelter in place. Shelter in place refers to taking immediate shelter within the stadium. Stadium spectators and participants should shelter in place when an incident occurs outside or external to the stadium, such that existing the stadium exiting to exiting the stadium would take too long or expose the stadium spectators and participants to more danger than they remaining in the stadium. Sheltering in place is a precaution aimed to keep individuals safe while they remain indoors or at a location that is somewhat protected from an incident, i.e. underneath the stands in the bathroom. Following questions for consideration and supporting actions uh, statements are useful in performing sheltering in place. Then we have relocation. Relocation may occur at a stadium in response to a localized incident that does not require mass evacuation. During a relocation occurrence, stadium spectators and participants will be moved from the area where a localized incident occurred to another area of the stadium or stadium property, like the parking lot. The relocation may be temporary or permanent depending on the incident and the time frame of the event. Relocations do not usually result in termination of the event occurring at the stadium. Relocation areas will be designed or designated by stadium staff and the public will be directed to these locations when the situation warrants. The following questions for consideration and supporting action statements are useful in performing relocation. Naturally, with the example of Lahaina, those that uh, apparently ignored the orders of these individuals, these types of individuals, the people representing groups and the taking authority or control of the area, those uh, citizens and people that live there, the, the residents that ignored their directives actually survived. Those that followed them did not, apparently. Then we have supporting actions, evacuation routes, and pedestrian vehicular traffic control. The following questions for consideration supporting action statements are useful in establishing evacuation routes and executing established traffic control procedures. Then we come to the local city school district policies and procedures. This is from uh, Utah, I believe, February 24th. 2009 Emergency Preparedness and Response Plan. See references Utah Administrative Code. School Emergency Response Plan. And here we have 
different things, policy, incident preparedness plan, standard operation procedures, and uh, this document as far as its relation to the others is not as in-depth or doesn't have as much uh, information involved in it. But there is, of course, in the policy, protects district property and regulates the operation of schools during such emergencies. Ensures intervention, prevention, response, and recovery measures are in place. Right? Intervention. And, of course, there's a lot of other um, interesting phrasing, different interesting wording included in this document. Here on the last page of this document, the last page in this video, you'll notice some headlines. We have students, custodial staff, PTA, school, community council, parents and guardians, food service staff, school nurse, and public health department. Public health department, of course, is very infamous, and I've done a few videos on their particular activities, which all relate to the activities that we've looked at in this video. We have district facilities, planning, construction, and maintenance staff, district transportation personnel, school emergency preparedness and response plans. School emergency preparedness and response plans include school emergency preparedness and response plan committees. So considering all of these mechanisms, all of these uh, guidelines, all these things that are all designed, essentially speaking, to either cause or increase the casualties in a mass casualty event. A lot that would be involved in these operations might be ignorant of what the ultimate purpose is behind them. So that one has to wonder who exactly is knowledgeable and willful in the execution of these events. That's, I suppose, for another time. But we certainly know why, how, and that, of course, these events have happened before.